the heavenly king, the comfort of the spirit, the truth, where it ever comes and fills all things, treasure of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from all impurity and save our souls, O oh, good one. Amen. Okay, so tonight, uh, as I've done with you a number of times over the past year anyway, uh, we're going to focus our attention on the epistle reading, uh, which we'll hear read in church uh, this coming Sunday. And so before we start and we uh, comment on it as the Holy Fathers speak of it, I thought we'd read the epistle together uh, so that we have it in our mind before we proceed any further. So this Sunday's epistle is taken from the first uh, letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, the 16th chapter, beginning to read around the 13th verse until the end of the, uh, the, end of the book, actually, the end of the letter. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Ikea, and that they have destroyed themselves, uh, have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus, for what was lacking on your part they have supplied. For they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in, that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. The salutation with my own hand I have written. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So that's the epistle reading that we'll hear read uh, in church this coming Sunday. And it just so happens to be the very last verses or the conclusion of St. Paul's whole first letter to the Corinthians, uh, which of course we've been reading, if you've paid attention, uh, pretty consistently over the past five or so Sundays. Now, as one might expect from a conclusion, the first thing that the Holy Apostle Paul does is sort of sum things up. He repeats the central messages of the whole of his letter in just a few lines. So what does he do? How does he sum up this whole first letter to the Corinthians? What does he say its main points are? First, he reminds the Corinthians to keep pure their confession of faith, to persevere in right belief. Watch, he writes, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Now, hearing these words, St. Chrysostom observes that if the faith, the things we believe in other words, were built upon the wisdom of this world, if they were the product of our intellects, in other words, then St. Paul could in no way have told the Corinthians to stand fast, because as St. Isaac the Syrian says, the intellect always hesitates in the face of truth. It can never be absolutely certain that it's right about anything, and so it wavers. But our faith, the Holy Chrysostom adds, is not built upon the intellect. However, it is built upon the experience of the saints, and therefore, because it is built on this experience, it is unshakable. And so this is why the Apostle Paul is able to tell them to stand fast in their faith. It's sort of like we might think just like science. Scientific theory, theories of science, can always be proven wrong. We take principles and we reason from them and we build theories. But our, our conclusions in science might always be wrong so long as they're theoretical. But the empirical evidence, the things that come directly from our observation, are unshakable. They're things that cannot be moved. And so it is with our faith. Uh, things that are built upon the foundation of the intellect are always shakable. Uh, they're always going to be uncertain and questionable. But uh, our faith, the Orthodox faith, comes from the experience of the saints, which is indeed something immovable and unshakable. And thus, the Apostle Paul is able to tell the uh, Corinthians to stand fast in their faith. So first he reminds them to stand fast or to stand unshakably in the true faith. The second point of his epistle, he says, uh, is the reminder that they need to live 
the Christian life in all of its virtue. Let all that you do, he writes, be done with love. For love is the summation and the apex, the highest point of all the Christian virtues. It is love of neighbor and love of God, which allows us to set aside our own bodily comfort and our own advantage and embrace the narrow path that uh, Paul has set before us throughout the course of this letter. Without love, it is impossible to do any of these things. It's impossible to seek the advantage of the other unless we have love for him. And then, having set out the main points of his letter in sort of theoretical terms, St. Paul next tells the Corinthians where to look in order for them to gain a better understanding of these things that he set before them, that he's reminded them of. Notice, however, that he does not refer them to some book in order to give them a better sense of the things they've been taught, but rather he refers them to living examples, to people who show forth the desired qualities in their lives and in lived experience. You know, he writes, the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and I urge you, brethren, to submit to such. In other words, the Holy Apostle is telling them, look at these people, follow their guidance and their lead, for in them you will see uh, that this high calling of ours, the life, the narrow way that St. Paul has described throughout the course of this letter, is indeed something possible, something that can indeed be lived. And now, of course, if we think about it, Paul's advice might equally be applied to us. To gain the conviction that the Christian life is indeed something possible for us, while at the same time learning all of its ins and outs, what it looks like in applied experience, we too must look for good examples in the same way St. Paul points the Corinthians to the house of Stephanus. We must go to the monasteries while we're on vacation. Now vacation, we'll just remind that we've said a couple times over the course of the summer, vacation is a time of rest for the body and mind from our work, from our jobs. But our spiritual life never takes a vacation. God does not go on vacation. So when we go on vacations, we should still look for opportunities to live our spiritual life and to benefit spiritually. And so one of the ways in which we can set these examples for us, for you it's not so difficult. You can travel a very small distance and you can go to the monasteries and have contact with the, the monastics. For us here on St. John's, it's a significantly uh, longer and more difficult process and takes a little bit of planning for us to get anywhere near any of the monasteries. But nonetheless, if we want to see these examples of the faith lived out in its highest form, we need to go to the monasteries and meet the monastics and gain a, a taste at least of their lives. But what else can we do if we, if we want to sort of be brought face to face with these examples? We ought, of course, to be ever reading the lives of the saints. Now with the internet, as it is in our modern world, we have very easy access to all of these texts. And so we have no excuse not to read at least one life of a saint per day. We, for example, have the, the prologue uh, from Ured online, uh, the, the book written by St. Nikolai Vyodomirovich where he'll sort of uh, present the basic lives of the saints and a little homily at the end and a few prayers in between. And there, if we read this prologue, uh, we'll find each day the life of one particular saint presented to us. Uh, but if we want to go even more in depth, we have the Synaxarian of our church, which presents sometimes, you know, 30 and 40 pages of lives of saints each and every day. Um, so, but particularly, I wanted to mention the internet, the fact that on the internet, there's so many lives of saints. And this is just an opportunity for us to take something which is generally sort of a noetic garbage can, like our computer that sits in front of us, and to actually use it for something blessed and beneficial throughout the course of the day. So, just as St. Paul says, St. Paul points the Corinthians to living examples of their faith in order to be uh, strengthened in their pursuit of Christian virtue, so it is with us. If we want to be strengthened and uh, built up in our desire, we need to see living examples. We need to see indications that the life uh, in Christ is indeed possible. And the way we do that is we go to the monasteries particularly. But we can also use the internet for something good for once and take the time to look up a single life of an Orthodox saint every day and read at least one of the treasury of things that is indeed out there. Now, so that was basically the summary 
of the epistle. St. Paul makes these two great points that he that run throughout like threads throughout the first letter of the Corinthians. First, that they have to be extremely sound in their faith, and second, uh, that they must live the Christian life of virtue, and that these two things combine together uh, to lead us towards salvation. One without the other won't work. They have to both be present, true faith and true life. At the very end of this passage, though, there's something very interesting. In the final two verses, in fact, uh, St. Paul says something which is indeed very important and something which St. Chrysostom focuses on and says some very beautiful things about. And it's here on these two last verses that I want to focus our attention uh, for the rest of our evening together. So St. Paul closes his letter to the Corinthians after he's done this long summation in the following way. He says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, if we take a minute to just let these words sink in, we'll realize quite quickly, I think, that they're, they're beautiful spiritual words. It's on the one hand, a prayer for God's blessing for those to whom he writes. And on the other hand, it's an assurance of his own personal fatherly love for them in Christ. Now, what makes these words all the more beautiful is when we call to mind, when we remember that the whole of this letter, which is about 14 pages long, 1 Corinthians is roughly 14 pages long, 16 full chapters, was written to the Corinthians not under the best of circumstances. The whole letter is, in fact, a long, winding rebuke but one very carefully and spiritually orchestrated. What's a rebuke? A rebuke is when we correct someone, right? It's a whole, this whole letter is a rebuke of the uh, instability of faith and the instability of life of the Corinthian Christians. And so seeing opportunity in this observation, observing that this is what St. Paul has been doing throughout the whole course of his letter, St. Chrysostom in his final comments on St. Paul's letter speaks at length about the role of rebuke and correction in the Christian life. Now, St. John Chrysostom begins his whole commentary on these last two lines by pointing out that it is indeed our Christian obligation to restore our brothers and sisters to the right path when they've fallen away. That's something important for us to remember. St. Chrysostom actually says it's our obligation to offer rebuke and correction to Christians who have fallen away from the true path. It is not something, it is not loving to stand back and watch an accident, for example, without stepping in and lending a hand. And so in the same way, it's not loving to watch someone's life become a spiritual wreck without doing anything about it or having no interest in what's going on with the person. Or perhaps better, St. Chrysostom directly says, we are never Ill, uh, indifferent towards illness in one of our physical limbs, for example. We, you know, if, if our hand hurts or if we have a wound on our hand, we don't ignore it, we do something about it. We go to the doctor if it's serious and have it stitched up, or you know, we put a little bit of medication on to dull the pain or something like that if it's less serious. So in the same way that we don't ever ignore illness or pain in one of our limbs, so St. Chrysostom says, we should never be indifferent towards the spiritual illness that is in one of the members of the, of the, of, uh, the church. For we all together are the body of Christ and members one of another in St. Paul's own words. We are all one body and the illness in one member of this body of which we are all members, is grievous to all of us. So on account of this, he says, we are in fact obliged to correct our brothers and sisters sometimes. But then he asks, what should our motivation be when we do this, when we set out to make a correction or to, to offer correction? Chrysostom's answer to this question is immediate and sharp. He says our motivation ought to be love. Now, our first reaction when someone gets in an accident isn't to get angry with them, is it? We can't think of a simple example where that's the case. We see someone hurt or we see a child fall down. It's unusual for someone's initial reaction 
uh, to something like that to become angry. It's just not natural. It's completely unnatural for us to react that way. Rather, our reaction is more naturally to seek to help them out of love, recognizing their need and desiring better circumstances for them. That's the natural thing to do, to step in and help, to desire that their situation be better than it is. Now, of course, we all know well the Lord's saying, how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? Uh, sorry. How can you say to your brother, the Lord says, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, there is a plank in your eye. First, he says, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is a very well-known passage uh, from St. Matthew's Gospel. Now, some people in their own minds, and maybe we ourselves sometimes, when they first approach this passage, they're tempted to wrongly interpret it as saying that you have to be sinless in order to correct someone or to rebuke someone. That the log in our eye, in other words, is a log of sin. This, however, brothers and sisters, is not how the Holy Fathers interpret this passage. In the patristic account, in the account of the fathers, the log is indeed anger or a lack of love. This is what obstructs our vision and makes us incapable or uh, not in a good position at least to help those who are in spiritual need or who stand in need of correction. We don't have to be sinless in order to step up and offer someone spiritual help, but we do have to be sure that we're pure of anger or that we're at least uh, not full of a lack of love. So we need to have love if we're going to correct someone, if we're going to step in and correct someone. Now, Chrysostom adds, there's indeed more than one way to offer correction, and this is something very important I think we all need to keep in mind, uh, both me as a priest and you as Christians living in the world. So there's more than one way to offer correction. Let's begin by looking at the one which is wrongly, I would say, less obvious to us. Now we are, of course, here speaking of the means of prayer, prayer as a means of correction, which of course should never be the least obvious to us because prayer should be our constant refuge in the life in the world. Every time we get into a difficult situation, our immediate response should be to go to prayer. So it should never be the least obvious solution to anything in our life as Christians Nonetheless, for most of us, perhaps it is the least obvious means of offering uh, correction to our brothers and sisters. Now, prayer as a means of correction is very important. And it's important especially if we're struggling uh, with anger at the person who stands in need of being corrected. St. John of Kronstadt, the well-known uh, Russian saint and spiritual father, says that when we speak, the sinful movements of our hearts, our hidden intentions, are conveyed even if we hide them. So if we approach someone that we're uh, you know, about to offer some uh, correction to, but we have a hidden pathos towards them, we have anger hidden in our heart towards them for what they've done or what they've done to someone else, uh, even if we hide that anger physically, St. John of Kronstadt says, words by their very nature will somehow secretly convey that pathos and that passion to the person we're speaking to. But, he says, when we pray for people, this is never the case. Because what God does is he reaches in and he purifies our intention and offers his own grace in order to help the person in question. So when we try to correct people, and we're full of passion ourselves towards them especially, that passion will be conveyed to them with when we speak to them with words, no matter what we do. It's just the nature of, of human communication, according to St. John. However, when we pray, we submit the matter to God, and God offers the correction through grace. And of course, we, his grace is without passion and can't possibly cause damage to people. And so this least obvious means of correcting our brothers and sisters, which is our Christian obligation, as St. John Chrysostom said, is often the absolute best one, especially for struggling with anger. 
because prayer is the only means of ensuring that our own passions aren't going to get involved in the procedure. So our first thought then should be of prayer, as it should be in every circumstance in our life. If, however, St. John says, we find ourselves without anger towards the person, we might then, having taken careful stock of the condition of our soul, we might then consider speaking to the person. And St. Chrysostom gives us many helpful points regarding how we might approach just such a conversation. And I'll try to synopsize or uh, condense these a little bit for us tonight uh, so we can have some of them in our heads in our lives going forward. So first step. First, St. Chrysostom says, if you're going to try to approach someone and correct them by speech, he says, do not allow yourself to have thoughts about the motivations of the person needing correction prior to speaking to them. Don't think about what they did. Just assume that their actions proceeded out of ignorance. Something very important. Don't, if we're intending to go and speak to somebody about some issue, don't let ourselves have any thoughts about their motivations. Because, of course, what's going to happen? If we let our mind run free and we enforce, reinforce our own sense of what the person's motivations were that led them to the position of needing to be corrected, that is all that that's going to do is reinforce passions and feelings towards them within us. And as St. John of Kronstadt says, then when we go to them, we're going to have a whole bunch of baggage and that baggage is going to be communicated to them. So St. Chrysostom says, don't let yourself have any thoughts concerning their motivation. How do we avoid having thoughts? Every time we start thinking about why the person did what they did, we get on the prayer rope. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And we get rid of those thoughts so as not to have uh, passions get involved in, in our conversation with the person. And in fact, we can put in, as he says uh, also, we can put in a positive thought. We can, uh, if we find our minds starting to turn over why they did what they did, St. Chrysostom says, just keep reinforcing with yourself. No one would do that if they knew better. No one would know better. No one would do that if they knew better. Don't let yourself think about their motivations. Just assume ignorance. That way we don't build up passion towards the people that we're about to, about to speak to. So second, what else can we do when we're preparing to, to speak to someone and offer correction in a situation where we feel it's needful? He says, don't gossip about their moral lapse or their mistakes with anybody. That's another very important point. If we're going to speak to someone about something very serious that's occurred, we can't have spent any time gossiping about it with people around us. For the more we sort of mull their actions over, the more we let them sort of go through our thoughts, the more we talk about them with other people, the stronger our opinions about what this person has done will become and our passions will well up within us and this will come across to them when we speak. So we have to block out thoughts about what's going on, about their motivations, and we can't be found gossiping about the person and the, the thing that's taken place if we're going to dare to, to step up and offer correction. So instead of having opinions and uh, feelings about what the person did, we ought to just experience, St. Chrysostom says, in place of this sort of gossip and thoughts about what they've done, we ought to solely have a pain and a melting heart for them. We ought to feel nothing but sorrow for their sake, that they have stumbled on the path of salvation. Our heart must absolutely be broken for them. That's a high task so far. We, we jump to correction, I think, very easily a lot of times, even as priests. As priests, we, we jump in a little early, uh, but St. John Chrysostom is setting a very high uh, standard of what we have to achieve if we're going to dare to step into some a situation like this. That's not to say that we're not going to be put in situations where we're called to do it, but we have to have an idea of the, res the Christian responsibilities associated with uh, undertaking this kind of action. So a third step, St. Chrysostom adds, go to them, he says, in complete privacy. 
if we do something like this, if we try to correct someone publicly, we'll probably embarrass them, and this will cause them to defend themselves, and therefore they'll resist the correction. And our whole goal is to be able to help them and not have them build up walls that are going to block out what we're trying to say. And so he says, go to them privately. Uh, we pray in the morning prayer of St. Philard. I don't know if you, if you pray this all the time. Uh, but in a lot of the Slavic prayer books, there's a prayer of St. Philaret of Moscow, uh, sort of a blessing on the coming day. And one of the things that he says in this prayer is, uh, teach me to deal with people in a way that doesn't embarrass them. This is a very important principle because if we're going to get our message across, we can't have people, uh, we can't put people in a situation for them to build up walls and not be able to receive uh, what we're telling them. So first of all, no thoughts, no thoughts about their motivations. We can't gossip about what they've done. We have to control our tongue and not talk about it with anyone except the person themselves. Third, we have to go to them in absolute privacy so as not to cause them embarrassment. Then fourth, St. Chrysostom says, when we do finally speak to them, we need to speak very gently and these are some very important points here, so listen carefully to these. First, he says, speak very gently. Second, he says, praise the person's good qualities. Praise the person's good qualities. Then, he says, speak of your own sinfulness, of how on account of your own sins, you are in no way qualified to offer correction to somebody. But love forces you to speak. Remind the person, also he says, that we are all sinners, that sin is the common condition of all humankind. It's something we all share in common and something through which we all suffer. And also he says, ask forgiveness for even daring to speak about such a matter. So you can see the depth of humility with which St. Chrysostom uh, sees we should, uh, should have if we're going to go into this situation. Praise the person's good qualities. Speak of our own sinfulness, of how on account of our sins, we aren't actually qualified to do this, but love is what's motive. Well, love forces us to do this. Remind the person that we're all sinners and ask forgiveness for even daring to speak. Now, all of this, while all of it is indeed true, it serves a greater purpose in the sort of dialogue that's taking place between the two people, the corrector and the correctee, we might say. It helps the person who's being corrected put their guard down so that they can take in what's being said to them. And Chrysostom has a very good image for this. He likens it, this whole activity, this sort of self-deprecation, this humility, and this praise of the person to whom you're correcting. Chrysostom likens this to the bands that a doctor uses to tie down a patient before surgery so that he can then apply the knife. Is what do we need to do when we have a patient and you bring him into surgery, he can't be flopping around while you're trying to do surgery on him and trying to get away from you. He needs to be relaxed and he needs to be laying there very still. And so Chrysostom says all of these things, this, this self-effacing uh, acknowledgement of, sinful, of our own sinfulness, the lack of pride in doing so, the iteration that what we're doing comes out of love, all this helps the person be able to keep still and receive the medicine that's being offered to them. And then fifth and finally, St. Chrysostom says, only once we have done all thing, all these things can we possibly begin to address the, ma the matter with the person. And then he says when we do address it, we need to address it briefly and concisely, like knife strokes. We want to make it as painless as possible for the person so that uh, their ego isn't um, worked up, and they turn against what's being told them. We want to work like a surgeon, in and out, very quick. Now lastly, the last thing St. Chrysostom mentions in this uh, long commentary on rebuking and correction. He addresses what to do if someone comes and corrects and rebukes us. The shoe gets put on the other foot now. For if it is indeed our obligation to correct, then we must also, he says, be very ready to accept correction ourselves. 
So how do we do this? First, he says, we have to remind ourselves that correction, and he, you'll find St. John often uses these medical references. He says, the correction is like surgery. It causes pain, but it's ultimately beneficial. So when someone comes up to say, to, uh, to say something to us that we know uh, is correcting us and we may not like it, we have to remind ourselves, correction is like surgery. It hurts, but it's beneficial. And we must thank God for those who take the time out of their day to come to us and care enough to try and correct us. We must see them as our benefactors. But then lastly, what do we do about those situations where someone comes to offer correction to us, but we don't think that we've done anything wrong or anything worthy of correction? Well, the first thing we have to remember is that there's never a single situation in which we are completely without sin. It's the human condition. We make mistakes in every situation. We can find areas for humility, for we've always made mistakes. Hidden in every, in every criticism, not just the ones we like, hidden in every single criticism is something true. It's our task to root through what's been said to us and find even that speck of truth and then use the speck of truth in that criticism in order uh, to correct ourselves and for the sake of our own humility. So instead of rejecting something that's, that we don't agree with out of hand, we need to search through everything that was said to us and try to find just that speck that we can use to improve ourselves in our Christian struggle, to find our sins and confess them, and on the other hand, to inspire humility in us, a recognition that we are indeed far from perfect. And so that's all I had in mind to say to you tonight, at least to inspire maybe a little bit of discussion or a little bit of thought. Um, we can open it up to a bit of uh, question and answer or discussion from there. Everybody's scared and hiding from the camera. Hello, Father. Um, when you were talking about uh, it's not good to watch someone who was sick and just stand by. There, were, there was an instance of a guy who was in a car accident and his car was catching on fire and there were six people filming it. Yeah, so they, I could saw post, that. they could post it online and one guy got up, put the phone down, busted the window, dragged the guy out. And if they'd done that when they started filming, rather than just filming, the guy yeah. wouldn't have had half the burns that he had. And then they they probably, yeah, it was nuts. So I mean, that include, exactly. your Christian duty includes not filming it to put it on the internet. No, that's that's love growing cold. I mean, that's exactly what the scriptures speak of about the end times. I mean, to to be in the position in our human the course of our human history that we could stand by and film something like that without getting involved is just unbelievable. It's truly love grown cold. It's frightening. God of mercy. Sort of on the other side of that, there was a guy who had a seizure and fell onto the tracks of a subway. And this guy was standing there with his four kids. And he jumped on top of him just in time for the train to go over him. And he held him, held the guy down so he wouldn't get on, get across the rails while he was doing that. And uh, they interviewed him afterwards, and he said, um, well, I, that was what I was there for. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I used to have a really bad life. And at one point, it got to somebody putting a gun to my head. And when they went to shoot me, it jammed. Right. So I knew I would save at that point, do something, and this is what I had to do. So he was yelling from underneath the subway to his kids, Daddy's okay, Daddy's okay. <laughs> he was really calm, just did it, and got up. And they said, oh, you're a hero. He says, no. <laughs> This is, this is that's what I was supposed to do. So it's yeah, still out there. I think it's a good paradigm for what we're talking about. I mean, it, we who have been set free from sin by God's grace, I mean, have that obligation to those people around us to, if we've received any any of God's grace through you know spiritual guidance and things like that, 
uh, we have an obligation to purify ourselves so that we can be of use to those people around us. Hi, Father. A quick question. Thank you. Who's hiding? I'm hiding today. Um, but everybody knows my annoying voice. So, in any event, um, um, I, I'm going to speak among women because uh, I am one. Generally, women find it very, when they get hurt by somebody or somebody has wronged them in any way, uh, women more than men, I would have to say, generally find it really hard to keep their mouths shut about a, a, a situation. So they'll go to their closest friends, sisters, bro, you know, best friends, um, normally just to vent um, without uh, causing um, malice towards the person who did them wrong. So when you were naming those steps uh, for, for us to take, I mean, how, I find it, I mean, I know what you're going to say. I mean, if we follow those steps, that's what God wants us to do. But how bad is it when women, I'm just speaking of women, I can't talk for men now, but <laughs> women find it really difficult with, you know, to not vent. I mean, not, I mean, not, I'm, there's a, and I'm talking, there's a far fetch between gossiping and scandalizing the person, but actually vent. I mean, somebody hurts me, I have to talk about it with at least one of my friends like normally my best friend because i'm hurt and i need to get it out and i know that's my ego and i know i'm completely wrong in doing it so i, I recognize it but as women who tend to be more you know emotional or sensitive than men yeah. it's very hard yes it is but uh um father Polly, um, Procopio just said I'm being very sexist, and yes, I am, because men, uh, God, men made men for a certain reason, and and women for other reasons. So we're not the same, contrary to what everybody likes to say. Men vent too, but we just break stuff. Yes. So what I'm trying is, what do you recommend for us women to kind of deal with that? Because, you know, if we have to express it or else we're going to blow up or we're going to eat. Generally we yeah. eat, you know, like we, that's when our binging happens. I'm not trying to make a joke, but it's true. It's that's when a lot of women tend to turn to food, which then turns into gluttony, which then turns into another sin. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's sort of like a domino effect. You know what I mean? You instigate, you know, so what can you do in that instance? Do you just, you know, write to your spiritual father or do you just, but a lot of women, and I find it very difficult to keep their mouth, sh yeah. you know, any well, recommendation. And I, I'm being serious here. I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, I know what your answer is going to be. I know a lot of us do <laughs> we go. But. Well, okay. I think um, Thank the, you. First, the first thing is it may be a more pronounced problem, I think, in women sometimes. But men have the same problems, uh, you know. I, there's lots of situations I can think of where where I will have felt something and I'll want to tell Presbytera or something like that. And I have a very hard time not doing that. I'd go through the same thing. It's like a war in my head not to not to sort of tell her what's going on uh, sometimes. So men, men have the exact same type of thing, I think, the same type of passion. It's a bit more pronounced sometimes in women. Um, but I think the good word you used for that was vent. And I think as Metropolitan Anthony used, was wont to say at one time, we tend to, and I'm meaning this in the best possible way, we tend to make up nice words for nasty things sometimes. Uh, venting feels a lot nicer than gossiping or blasting or lambasting or anything like that. Vent is just a nice word to say it. Uh, so that's the first thing I think to acknowledge is the reality that look, it's it's not probably that good a thing to do. Secondly, I think one of the the things that is always uh, a good practice for us when it comes to avoiding sin is to begin uh, becoming aware or making ourselves aware of the consequences of the sin of what we're doing. So what are we doing when we quote unquote vent 
in reality? Well, number one, we're probably speaking judgmentally about somebody uh, because the reality is in most of the situations when we speak about others' act, others' actions, we end up speculating a whole lot, a lot more than we would normally recognize. Um, number two, we're doing exactly what St. Chrysostom said. We're reinforcing negative feelings. We're making them stronger and stronger because every time we repeat those thoughts and every time we repeat those feelings, they become more and more ingrained within us. And so that's why St. Chrysostom, when he just told us there, we our recourse is to prayer. We have to stop those thoughts rather than indulge them. And venting, unfortunately, can be a way of indulging it. So we have to acknowledge that, look, there is a consequence. There is a spiritual price to be paid for our venting. Now, that all being said, there probably are circumstances where the weight of what's happened to us is exceeding great for us. And we have a very hard time not talking about it. So if we're not, uh, if we're going to talk about it, I think the best thing we can possibly do is find a blessed environment in which to do that. And that's to go to the spiritual father and talk to the spiritual father about it. So that way it's done within a spiritual context. The spiritual father can let us speak our mind a little bit, and then he can correct those pieces that are, are not right about what we're saying and rebuke us a little bit and uh, help to drain or squeeze some benefit maybe out of what's not a particularly good situation. Um, so that'd be my main advice. I think the first thing, become aware that it's not a benign thing we're doing, even though we may think it's benign, it's not a benign practice. And second, if we do find it too heavy, the burden too heavy, to go to our spiritual father and talk about it within a protected environment where it can actually, we can be corrected and, and some benefit can come out of what we're saying rather than just reinforcing the passions. Thank you. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, oh, of course, of course it does. And and thank you very much. Um, and it's exactly what I thought you would say. How about in this context? That's other um, bad. I'm either getting very predictable or... Uh, no, no it's, it's not. It's you, you, speak, you, speak, you speak God, right? God's words. I mean, I'm not a naive yeah. person to understand. I'm just okay. trying to make... I'm just trying to make an excuse for myself to allow myself to quote on bed. But what if you're trying to protect others? No, for example, no, for example, you know of a situation that might put some other people, women, like in danger. Um, for example, and this is totally hypothetical, so I don't want everybody's mind, you know, running around right now. But what if there's somebody who, you know you know, takes women home and, you know, attempts to rape them. And this actually has happened. Mm. How do you then need to, without scandalizing the person, you know the person is very sick because that is very, very serious sure. illness. How do you protect your fellow Christian women without scandalizing the person? Because... How do you well, do it? I think probably in those cases when there is something very, very serious like that going on, I, I think we probably have to risk the person's scandalization a little bit. And we probably have to tell at least the people that look like they're in immediate danger that there is some sort of problem. Okay. But so I would, want to be, I would want to be darn sure what I'm saying is accurate before I did that. But I think in cases like that where there's danger involved, uh, probably you have to risk risk it and, and probably say something. But ask your spiritual father as well. That's the most important thing. Okay, thank you. Because there may you. be other parts of the situation that just aren't exposed or... Yes. Thank you. Yes, I'm not, I'm, I'm really talking about, you know, sometimes because you, you feel bad, right? Because we're all struggling. So you don't want to scandalize the person. But at the same time, who do you tell? Like, who do you, how do you protect? Because... Maybe God wants you to always be, also be the messenger to protect. I don't know. But anyways, thank you very much. I'll pass you on to somebody else. <laughs> thank you, Father. Hi, Father. My name's Anastasia. 
I just wanted to ask you, uh, my brother went through a bad divorce and my sister got sick. She uh, had schizophrenic. Some schizophrenic, you can go nuts and some, she's very quiet. And um, my niece and nephew are very good kids, but we've been having a lot of problems. And, you know, like I work with the police, I'm a crossing guard supervisor. And um, a lot of people at our church gossips a lot about that. And, you know, we're not a type to say, we're a type that we keep to ourselves. I'm very close to my family and I, like the kids are very good kids and we don't know what to do. We go to Father Peter and we speak to him and I don't know what to do about this. Cause you know, she got really sick when my brother divorced and his ex-wife left him for her ex-boyfriend. Yeah, well, and I want to know how can I deal without the gossiping? Cause they gossip too much that I go to church. I haven't gone for a long time, but you know. Well, uh, the thing is um, gossiping can be part of our cross. Uh, lots of the saints in the history of the church. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess that's one of the things I'd recommend, first of all, because uh, sadly, we're gossipers. Yeah. Human beings are gossipers. We like to talk mm -hmm. about other things, about other people. We like to put ourselves in positions of superiority. We just we just do it. It's, it's one of the ways we protect ourselves, often our own egos. Uh, we want to look, we want to feel better about our own situation, so we have to try to make other people look bad and talk about how bad their situation is. And it's just a way of ignoring our own sins and temptations. Um, so unfortunately, we're, we're gossipy animals. And uh, we'll get this no clearer than if you read the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. I mean, St. John goes on and on and on about the, the type of activities that he witnesses within the Christians in Antioch in the, the fourth century. I mean, the same types of problems you're describing are the same types of problems he was trying to stop in his own congregations. Um, but one of the valuable things that's the first thing I think to realize Look, this is gossiping is a human illness. If sin is an illness, gossiping is one of our diseases. Um, so it's not easy to stop. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to stop in terms of dealing with it ourselves and how we deal with it. I think one of the best ways we can, we can, uh, improve our own mindset in, a, in dealing with what's being thrust upon us, this sort of heavy temptation is, uh, to read the lives of the saints, yes. read a life of the saint like Saint Nectarius, okay. and see the type of slander and gossip and things that he suffered. I mean, this was an extremely holy person, holy beyond anything we've probably seen. Maybe next to Saint John of Kronstadt, who I mentioned uh, in recent times. I mean, no, there's not many people that would compare. I don't think. And God, God help me. I don't. I hope I haven't spoken wrongly. But in my view, anyway. Uh, the, there aren't a lot of people to compare St. Nectarius to. And what is it that made him, that just pushed his holiness beyond the edge in the end? It was the bearing of wrongs. It was that St. Nectarius took wrong after wrong after wrong after wrong with people slandering him and saying bad things about him and gossiping about him. He got kicked out of his you know positions he had, everything because people gossiped about him. And in the end, God revealed him uh, to be a saint. So it's good to have encouragement on our journey in Christ and to look and see that, okay, indeed, there are people who have who have gone through this type of similar thing with us. Um, the other thing I think is to realize that we just talked about it two weeks ago in the epistle, actually. Part of the narrow way of the gospel, when St. Paul describes the narrow way in detail at one point in 1 Corinthians, one of the things he mentions specifically, and Christ mentions it himself over and over again, that puts the Christian life over every other manner of life we can imagine. I mean, St. Paul himself says we're called to be admired not just by men, but our manner of life is to be so admirable that the angels themselves are, are, are admire us looking upon us. One of the things that puts us over that edge, that we're, what we're doing isn't just human, but superhuman, is the fact that we are called to love our enemies and bless those who curse us. But I just want to touch your father, sorry for interrupting. My sister wants to go for communion, but she's afraid, you know, cause she's a very quiet person. Mm -hmm. And like some people at our church, I'll tell you, cause we had a fundraising at our church and they called, not my sister, they called the girl a thief and the girl never did it. She saved something. And you know what, my sister's afraid. I don't know, she has a fear. I don't know, since my brother got divorced, she's afraid to go near to our priest. He's a good priest, he helps us. He did a fiel a few days ago, she was fine, but she gets scared at night and she cries. She goes, Anastasia, hold on to me because you know, 
know what? My parents are in their 80s. They're getting old. They're, you know what? And I'm very close to her. She was fine. But since my brother got divorced, she got sick. And you know what? Some people make fun of her. You know, she's a teacher. Doesn't have much. You know, and I help her. She was a dead. And you know what? People shouldn't gossip. You go to church and they laugh at her. You know what? She's healthy and everything. But she's a sick. She has a sickness. But you know what? It can happen to you or me, anybody, right? Like, even when my sister was at k Mitch downtown, people were laughing. There were lawyers, doctors, everything. They told me she was sick. But you don't make fun of somebody. You know, when you see people, they like to gossip. Even when I took her to church for fun. Yes, they were laughing at her. It's not funny. Well, it's terrible. But the only thing we can do from our perspective, we can never change the actions of those people, those people around us. The only thing we can do is labor really hard to bear the insults and bear the wrongs without having hatred sort of make our heart uh, hard. And so the only way we can do that is by looking at the examples of the saints, looking to saints who live through similar circumstances. And on the other hand, uh, remaining close to sort of our spiritual father, confessing our sins, and he'll give us confidence to do those types of things like like Holy Communion and things like that. Um, he'll give us the courage to come up uh, to the chalice if, if we're indeed worthy of that. Um, so stay close to the spiritual father, confess the sins regularly, remind ourselves that part of the Christian life is bearing these wrongs. This is part of, this is part of what we're called to do. Uh, as Christians, we're all going to suffer slander and wrong at one time or another. Uh, Christ Himself says, "As they as as, as they hated uh, as they hated me, so they'll hate you." We're all going to suffer wrongs. That's part of the narrow path of Christ. Thank you very much, Father. I appreciate it for all your help. Thank you. Sorry, Father. Um, I know. When, when you've been wronged and hurt, it's natural to want to comfort yourself. And either, whether that's from venting or gossiping or eating something <laughs> huge, <laughs> um, it, it becomes part of, is the solution worse than the crime? So you, yeah. you kind of have to go to the uh, deny yourself and follow me kind of thing yeah. and, go, and go back to the prayer rather than, you know, is the solution worse than the, the problem? So uh, if you're turning to prayer and you're you're just going through a dry period and you're not feeling anything or not uh, experience you're not really experiencing anything but how do you deal with a dry period I mean I think what we have to do first of all is under, try to understand what God desires by the dry period um, God allows us to experience those dry periods in order that we might be given an opportunity to manifest love in its true form, um, to push through in other words. Love is easy in circumstances where everything's going great and we feel wonderful. I mean, we know that in our own relationships with people. It's easy when we to love people who love us and treat us well. In fact, uh, you know, as Christ himself says, what is that, what is it to you if you treat those who treat you well, well? It's, to, it's no credit. It's not to your credit. Our credit, the narrow way, this way that becomes the admiration of the angels is when we actually sort of go beyond those things uh, and, and live the, the, the life in Christ uh, to the furthest extent possible. And so the dry spells give us an opportunity to push those limits in the Christian life. And if we abandon those opportunities, uh, if we think of our heart as sort of a vessel that receives the Holy Spirit, that pushing is an opportunity to expand the heart and receive a flood of grace later. If we lose those experiences and instead of pushing through them, go and find some other amusement in order to avoid the sort of pain that we feel or the anguish that we feel in that moment, then we just let our heart constrict and we lose that opportunity for growth. And so the big thing I think is to realize that God desires this as an opportunity to show true Christian love, which is beyond love that we understand, a normal sort of love that we might describe. Um, it's a big opportunity, and if we lose it, we'll we pay for it having lost it. Any of the long, long dry periods that I've had before is from generally me not wanting to feel the pain, yeah, not wanting to experience it, to get through it. This is actually Elder Ambrose, uh, Elder Ambrose of Optina, I think once said, uh, speaking of sort of his generation, uh, 
the basically the best we would be the best we would be able to do is simply not do anything to dull the pain. And what he meant by that was the occasion, okay, when we feel sorrow for our sin, um, we're not going to be like the great ascetics of old who did days of repentance or the sinner, the the monks that spent time in the prison in St. John Climacus or something like that. The best we're often going to be able to do is to feel that pain and allow it to rest within us and not just go out and do something else in order to dull it. You know, go have a drink or go do this or go do that in order to feel a little bit better about ourselves or to, to take our attention away from reality. So just Elder Ambrose said, just to simply bear this anguish for the few minutes it stays with us until God comes close to us again, it's going to be a great feat for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I think um, we're done for this evening. Um, nobody okay. seems to want to speak. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, as always for your attention so if you want to lead us into prayer right i don't know i'm not in charge of this it, you did well you did well <laughs> nico's on holiday so <laughs> okay christ the true light who does enlighten out and sanctify every man that cometh into the world let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us that in it we may see the unapproachable light and guide our steps in the performance of thy commandments by the intercessions of thine all immaculate mother and of all thy saints i mean the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thanks again. God bless. See you later.